today. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, CyberNet webinar series. Um, as, uh, as you probably know, this is a series that we have been um, um, uh, developing for the last uh, 14 or 15 months. Uh, and since last January, these are open um, to everyone in, in uh, which is interested in, in attending uh, any particular topic. Um, let me just uh, remind you a couple of uh, general uh, things for um, smooth um, development of the uh, webinar. So I would like to ask everyone to keep their micros and uh, cameras off during the presentation so that the uh, streaming goes uh, as smooth as possible. Um, uh, I would also uh, like to say that the uh, webinar today will be recorded. Uh, as we usually do, as long as we have the uh, consent for the um, um, speaker. Um, after the uh, webinar, the um, uh, recording will be uh, placed in the um, Cybernet uh, YouTube channel. So if everyone is um, interested afterwards, um, you can go there and, uh, and take another look to the presentation of uh, if anyone cannot attend in person, uh, in part of totally the presentation, it, uh, it will be uh, um, available in just a few days. So, um, as probably you all know, the uh, um, dynamic of these uh, webinars, uh, there will be um, a presentation will take around 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So if anyone is interested in, um, in, in making a question, uh, please go to the chat option in your Teams um, page and uh, just send your name and affiliation and I will um, I will uh, give you the floor to do the uh, question yourself. So there is no need to write down the question, just your name and affiliation um, saying that you're interested in, in making question. I think that will be more agile and, um, and makes life easier for everyone, and including the presenter. So um, <clears throat> the um, seminar, um, the webinar series is um, uh, taking place every other week, usually on Thursdays at 3.30. Um, if you're interested in um, um, looking at the program for the next few months, it's available at the CyberNet webpage, uh, I believe, until uh, July. Uh, we have all the slots already uh, um, covered. Um, so please go there and then check a look for future webinars. Okay, so um, after saying that, um, let's just uh, start and I would like just to um, introduce um, our speaker today. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you all um, to Monse Sole. Monse uh, got her PhD in neuroscience in the um, uh, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. Um, she did her PhD and uh, the first postdoctoral um, uh, phase uh, focused on the study of uh, cerebrovascular system dysfunctions in neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer's disease, but also on the involvement of these vascular alterations on neurodegeneration, both in AD and stroke pathologies. Um, after a postdoctoral stay in the um, Universidad Autónoma, uh, she did a stay at the Stanford University in the States, and then moved to the Neurovascular Research Laboratory at the Valdebron Institute for Research in Barcelona. Uh, since um, 2019, she is uh, an associate lecturer in biochemistry and molecular biology at the um, Universidad Autónoma of Barcelona. And in, in 2020, uh, she joined the Cell Signaling and Apoptosis Laboratory led by uh, Dr. Joan Cumella at Valdebron, um, where she's focused on the characterization of the role of the uh, death receptor antagonist, FAME-L, in uh, various uh, neurodegenerative disorders, specifically in um, AD and also in retinal diseases. So, um, with this, she will uh, present today a paper um, titled Novel Roles of Fast Apoptotic Inhibitory Molecule, FEM, in Neurodegeneration Associated Pathology. 
So thank you very much, uh, Monse, for your willingness to share with us the, uh, your work today. And um, the floor is yours, so please um, share your screen and uh, you can go ahead. Thank you, Miguel. I'm going to share the screen. And the presentation. Is that OK? Yeah, OK. okay. So uh, thank you, Miguel, for this kind introduction. And I would uh, have the opportunity also to thank the Cybernet for, uh, <coughs> sorry, for allowing me to present the studies that we are performing in the lab at the Institute of Research in Valdebron Hospital. And obviously, thank you all for attending. So today I'm going to talk about the role of an anti-apoptotic protein fame in neurodegeneration. Neurodegeneration is very concisely, a process by which neurons lost their function or their structure, and in most of cases, they finally die. Obviously, the loss of neurons has serious consequences in terms of cognitive on, or uh, motor function, and it accounts for numerous diseases in, for humans, such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, among others. Despite diverse clinical manifestations, Neurodegenerative diseases share common features and mechanisms, and these include, for example, a defective protein quality control and degradation pathways, dysfunctional mitochondrial homeostasis, among others, including neuroinflammation as well. All them contribute to the death of neurons, but the fact that they are regulated processes means that their knowledge can help us understanding how to modulate them in order to prevent or revert these neurological diseases. The process of cell death is, in most of cases, also a very regulated process. Although different pathways can conduct to cell death, depending uh, probably on the stimulus or also on the cell death, one of the most well-known so far is apoptosis. As most of, most of you may know, there are several apoptotic pathways with multiple proteins involved. The extrinsic pathway, for example, is initiated by the activation of death receptors and the intrinsic pathway involves the release of apoptotic factors from the mitochondria. Importantly, both pathways are interrelated and converge in the activation of effector caspases, for example, caspase 3 and caspase 7. Even with the importance of maintaining neurons during all our life due to the low rate of replacement, apoptosis in neurons occurs at the physiological level and represents a very important process during development, when neuronal network is established. However, neuronal death becomes a major problem and a clinical challenge in pathological situations, such as in neurodegenerative diseases. So the question is, why to maintain active this crucial molecular pathway in post-mitotic neurons? It was discovered that the apoptotic machinery, and in particular the key player in this apoptotic process, that is caspase 3, plays a determinant role in non-apoptotic functions in neurons, which are related with plasticity processes and connection remodulation. In order to avoid an undesired activation of apoptosis, there exists a relative high number of proteins named inhibitors of apoptosis. One example, for example, is SHAP. These are in charge of regulating the activity of this molecular pathway when uh, an excessive uh, activation of this can conduct to the undesired uh, neuronal death. Of particular interest are those exclusively expressed in neurons, which may provide an important chance for the emerge of normal therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. In this regard, in our group, it has been studied for a long time one of these inhibitors of apoptosis, that is FameLong. This one is, is an isoform that is particularly expressed in neurons and which an I'm going to focus in my talk today. So, the fast apoptotic inhibitor molecule, or FAM gene, contains six, six exons and different putative translational start sites. It codifies for four isoforms grown so far according to different transcript variants. The main ones are FAME short and FAME long, and these are generated by alternative splicing, shown here. FAMELONG contains 22 extra amino acids that are in the N-terminal region compared to FAMESHORT. In addition, there are other two minority uh, isoforms that are FAMESHORT 2A and FAMESHORT, and, sorry, and FAMELONG 2A 
that include the additional exon 2A here represented in the respective sequence. These molecules constitute a recently discovered family of proteins that is highly conserved through evolution and is structurally, structurally unrelated to other family proteins known. Here you can see the crystallized structure of part of the molecule together with the alpha fold prediction of the whole molecule, corresponding to the fame short sequence. In this case, the 22 extra amino acids of fame long would be in this part. A main difference among the principal isoforms, fame short and fame long, is that while fame short is expressed ubiqu ubiquitously, fame long is almost exclusively expressed in neurons. At the functional level, FAMES were described as inhibitors of apoptosis, but both isoforms do it through different mechanisms. FAME short was first discovered as, the, as a death receptor inhibitor in immune cells. Curiously, FAME short is able to induce resistance to fast mediated apoptosis in non neuronal cells, but it does not have the same effect in neurons. In neurons, however, it promotes neuronal differentiation and branching through the ERK and the NF-kappa B pathways. By contrast, FAME-long is able to inhibit both FAS and TNF-induced cell death in neurons, and it does this by two different main mechanisms. In one hand, FAME-long directly binds FAS, competing with FAT, and avoiding the activation of caspase 8. On the other hand, FAME-long stabilizes Xia, the main endogenous, endogenous inhibitor of the effector caspases. SHAP normally binds caspase 3 and inhibits it. Upon an apoptotic stimulus, SHAP undergoes auto ubiquitination and is degra degraded by the proteasome. Our group has described that fame long binding to SHAP prevents its ubiquitination adds it and its subsequent degradation, allowing it to keep caspase 3 inactive. In addition, this seems system seems to be more complicated, as we have recently uncovered a third partner in this system, that is Saiba 1. Saiba 1 is able, is able to bind both fame long and SHAP and displaces their union, therefore altering the consequent stability of SHAP, inducing the, its degradation and the consequent activation of caspase 3. Depending on the activation levels or the specific localization of active caspase 3, it can signal through apoptosis or activate these non-apoptotic functions, as I mentioned. These non apoptotic functions are related to neuronal plasticity and synaptic branding, and these are processes in which fame long is also involved. Neuronal plasticity is required in many forms of learning and memory, and where through long term potentiation or LTP and long term depression or LTD, synaptic adjustments occur. While in LTP, a gain of AMPA receptors is achieved at the surface of the synaptic membranes. LTD implies a decrease in the number of these uh, synaptic AMPA receptors and consequently the, weaken, the weakening of the synapse. Caspase 3 is found to be an essential effector in this process, LTD. Another non apoptotic mechanism of neuronal remodeling is neurite branding. This process is essential to sculpt neuronal connections as it removes excessive or inaccurate projections without resulting in the final death of the neuronal body. The fine-tuned regulation of caspase 3 activity by fame long and Saiba 1 confers to these proteins a determinant role in the regulation of these processes. Actually, as caspase 3, as caspase 3 activity regulator, we have described that fame long also plays a role in AMPA receptors internalization. Through in vitro chemical LTD approaches, we demonstrated that fame long overexpression, which prevents the caspase 3 activation, totally abrogates after AMPA receptors internalization during LTD processes activated by NMDA treatment. On the other hand, the participation of FEMLONG in the regulation of neurite branding was also demonstrated. We used dorsal root ganglion neurons placed in campenot chambers, shown here, which allows the establishment of two separate fluid compartments, one for the cell bodies and the other for the axons. With these systems, Axons degenerate in response to a local deprivation of FNGF. Interestingly, levels of fame long decrease during degeneration in this model, and an overexpression of fame long prevents this axonal degeneration. 
based on these results and being a long a regulator of caspase 3 activity, it's feasible to think that a degradation, an alteration of this regulatory protein could be involved in neurodegenerative diseases. So we studied the levels of, of fake long in brain tissue of Alzheimer's disease patients, as this is one of the most representative neurodegenerative diseases. We observed that fame long levels decreased both at the, at the mRNA levels and at the protein levels with the severity of the disease, showing very significant lower levels in BRAC6 patients. This decrease was also observed in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, the PS1 APP, where fame long significantly decreases at advanced ages. Looking for the cause of this fame long alteration, we treated primary cortic cortical neurons with beta amyloid aggregates. And we found that in these in vitro conditions, A beta induces a significant decrease in fame long, but not of fame short, indicating that A beta could be one possible cause of fame long decrease observed in the AD brain tissue. In addition, fame long was shown to be required for the neuroprotective effect of TNF alpha against A beta induced apoptosis. This was also performed in cortical neurons in vitro. TNF Activates, activates pro survival intracellular pathways and it's able to prevent the cell death induced by A beta. However, the blockade uh, shown in the black bars of fame long expression suppresses this TNF protective effect. Thus, the protective effect of TNF against A beta is dependent on fame long expression. After these results indicating an involvement of fame long in Alzheimer's disease associated neurodegeneration, we aim to find a good animal model to go in deep in this study. We analyzed different transgenic mouse models, and in contrast to what we expected, we found that mouse models which mostly present A-beta pathology, for example, the 5X-FAT or the APP23, did not show fame long reduction. However, mouse models of tauopathy presented a significant loss in fame long, suggesting a more complex situation in the downregulation of fame long rather than uh, the mere uh, involvement of A beta. In this regard, a sequential relationship between A beta and tau pathology has been postulated to occur. Whereas A beta aggregation would be the primary stimulus that would cause tau alteration and tau would be more related with the neuronal death. Based on the results, tau pathology could also be a cause of fame loss in vivo. To investigate a possible relationship between fame long and tau, we are now characterizing the fame long loss in the P301S mouse model of tauopathy. Besides, we performed an in vitro approach to identify proteins interacting with fame long. After co-immunoprecipitation and mass spectrometry, tau showed up, among other proteins and biological processes. This predicted interaction was validated by a specific co-immunoprecipitation in vitro where fame long was shown to co-immunoprecipitate -immuno better with tau compared to fame short. We are now following with these studies in order to elucidate the physiopathological meaning of this interaction between, between tau and fame long. Another strategy that we are using to learn about the role of fame long in neurodegeneration is to study the brain of fame knockout mice. So far, two different fame knockout mice have been created. But one limitation existing for us is that the two of them are lacking both fame isoforms, fame short and fame long, which limits somehow the association of the effect of a specific uh, effect found to a specific fame isoform. Regarding the models, both uh, models are via viable and show normal lifespan. In the first model that was developed by Juan collaborators by homologo recombination in 2009, an increased sensitivity, sorry, an increased sensitivity to fast-triggered apoptosis was uh, detected in some peripheral cells. In addition, there were detected some metabolic alterations that might be probably attributed to the fame short isoform, as it functions as a mediator of AKT signaling. However, these metabolic alterations were not reproduced in a second fame knockout mouse that was recently generated by, by Dr. Skaku and Rothstein in 2020. Interestingly, in the second model, the authors detected accumulation of ubiquitinated and, and aggregated proteins in peripheral organs following, after performing an in vitro, uh, an in, sorry, an in vivo oxidative stress insult 
with injection of menandiona. They confirm this effect by in vitro experiments using FAME uh, deficient cells. Protein aggregation, as you know, is one of the hallmarks in neurogenerative diseases. And in fact, these authors have recently reported that both isoforms of FAME are, not, are, are able not only to prevent, but also to dissolve pathological aggregates of A beta in vitro. To explore the possible alterations of FAME deficiency in neurons, we collaborated with Dr. Huo and Dr. Lam to study the brains of their uh, knockout mouse model. FAME knockout brains did not show apparent structural abnormalities, nor alteration in the morphology and layers of the different brain regions, and they showed absence of apparent apoptotic cell death at any age uh, studied. The expression of the main synaptic proteins in the hippocampus was not altered in FAME knockout mice, neither neurogenesis or dendritic, dendritic arborization. Yeah. Thus, we did not find any relevant brain alteration that could be associated to the absence of FAME in these animals. However, since besides brain, other organs in the central nervous system can be affected by neurodegeneration, for example, the retina, we next studied this neuronal tissue in these mice. Interestingly, FAME is highly expressed in retinal tissue, especially in rod photoreceptors. In addition, alterations in FAME expression have been reported in Norris disease. Mice showing this pathology can have an abnormal development of the retina with blindness and report a decrease in FAME expression. Also, two, mRNA, uh, two microRNAs that have been reported to regulate FAME expression have been associated to different retinal pathologies, such as retinitic pigmentosa and diabetic retinopathy. From these evidences, we evaluated possible neurodegeneration, neurodegeneration signs in the retina of FAME cow mouse model of uh, Dr. Huo and collaborators. Very briefly, the retina is a very specialized and organized neuronal tissue that is in charge of processing the phototransduction, phototransduction signals. It's formed by different layers that include nuclear layers, separated but by other layers with absence of cell nuclei. In the more superficial part, we find the ganglionar cells layer. And going deeper, we find a second layer with bipolar, amacrine, and horizontal cells. More deeply, we find the photoreceptors layer with rods that are more abundant and cones. In addition, retina possesses a specialized glial cell type, that is, the Mueller cells. Since the absence of fame was previously associated to increased aggregates of ubiquitinated proteins in peripheral tissues, we first studied whether this phenomenon was also occurring in the retina of fame knockout mice, and we analyzed these mice at 2 and 12 months of age. Results, as you can see, showed a significant increase of ubiquitin positive cells in the internal nuclear layer and in the ganglionar cells layer, already from 2 months of age. Bipolar and ganglionar cells are the cells that are found in these layers. We then measured whether this ubiquitin accumulation was associated to an increased uh, uh, appearance of uh, markers of inflammation markers. Inflammation is a phenomenon strongly associated with neuro neurodegeneration. And we observed that GFAP, both in MR mRNA levels or by immunofluorescence, showed a significant increase in this marker, indicating the activation of Mueller cells. Retina is a vascularized tissue as well, and similar to the brain, it possesses a blood retinal barrier that isolates this tissue from the peripheral surrounding. The retinal vascular system contains different vascular levels that irrigate the different, vascular, the different retinal layers. As the vascular system can be affected by alterations in the parenchyma, or alternatively, uh, it can happen on the other way around, we explored the blood retinal barrier integrity in fame knockout mouse by measuring the parenchymal extravasation of Evans Blue. Results showed increased number and intensity of Evans Blue extravasations in fame deficient mice, both at 2 and 12 months of age. These alterations were basically found in the superficial vascular plexus, that was irrigating the ganglionar cells layer, which also showed the highest uh, GFAP signal. 
We next analyze whether cell death was increased in these FAME knockout retinas as a conse consequence of the FAME deficiency itself or due to the alterations that we just uh, mentioned. A moderate decrease in the number of photoreceptor rows was detected in the outer nuclear layer, only at advanced stages. Uh, that was 18 months old, but not before. No significant differences were observed in ganglion ulcer layer, and in the same line, a significant number of tunnel positive cells was detected in the retinas of fame local mice, also at this age, at uh, 18 months of age, but without representing a massive increase in cell death. However, by OCT micrograph, we could detect a significant decrease in the whole retina thickness, that it was accounted basically for the outer nuclear layer, where photoreceptors are located. In the absence of a massive cell death, we analyzed a possible uh, compensatory signaling pathways that could be active under these conditions. It has been described as an endogenous protective response by which photoreceptors, when, let's say when they are in trouble, they can uh, induce the activation of Mueller cells by the production of endothelin 2. This signal induces the consequent increase in GFAP uh, that indicates the activation of Mueller cells and the release of FGF2 that uh, accounts for a, a delay in photoreceptor degeneration. When we analyzed the levels of endothelin 2 in retinas of fame knockout mice, we found an increased immunoreactivity in the outer plexiform layer at 12 months of age. The signal was found enclosing the nuclei and following the axonal projections of cones, cone photoreceptors, which are distinguished, uh, distinguished from rods by the discontinuous heterochromatin, as shown in this diagram. Accordingly, endothelin 2 mRNA and FGF2 mRNA were found significantly increased at 12 months of age. The results suggested that the endothelin 2 survival signaling pathway is activated in this fame knockout retinas. Since changes at the signaling level had been found, we next focused on alterations that could occur at the functional level in the absence of fame. In collaboration with uh, the laboratories of Dr. Enrique de la Rosa and Dr. Pedro de la Villa in Madrid, we per performed in, in vivo retinal function studies on the 18 months old mice. We first performed standard electroretinograms in order to measure the electric activity of the retina in response to a light stimulus. Here you can see a representative image of uh, one typical uh, electroretinogram. When different intensity lights are applied, the electrical response obtained can give us an idea of which cell types functionally can be altered. In this sense, according to this image, the A wave would correspond to the photoreceptor hyperpolarization and the B wave represents the bipolar cells depolarization. Electroretinogram results showed that the amplitude of both waves was decreased in fame knockout mice with increases, increasing intensities of the light stimulus. You can see the, the fame deficient mice in, in red. These results indicated that Alter, that there were alterations in the activity of both photoreceptors and their associated bipolar cells. In order to discriminate between the activity of rod, rod and cone photoreceptors, we performed a special uh, protocol that is named Flicker. In this protocol, a constant low intensity light bleaches rod's response and sequential flashes induce a specific cone response. The, un, the absence of differences indicated that the alterations observed in the A wave amplitude are mainly due to alterations in rod photoreceptors instead of cone photoreceptors. In addition, uh, we can measure other, other parameters in electroretinograms uh, after bright light flashes exposure. After this, they appear uh, small wavelengths that are named oscillatory potentials and being the fourth one, or OP4, uh, elicited by retinal ganglion cells. The activity of these cells can also be explored with the stimulation with low luminances that do not trigger a signal uh, for, from photoreceptors or bipolar cells, but are able to activate somehow ganglion cells. 
analyzing the results corresponding to this data, OP4 and the STRs, we found that in both cases, the activity of ganglion cells is reduced in fame knockout uh, retinas. These results, therefore, indicated that photoreceptors and especially roads bipolar cells and ganglional cells activity is reduced in retinas of fame knockout mouse. In addition to going deep in these functional alterations, we next performed a dark adaptation protocol in which two light flashes are separated by different times. After the reception of a light stimulus, photoreceptors are bleached and they need a time to recover the sensitivity to light and to respond with the same intensity to a second stimulus. If the time between the two light stimuli is not enough to allow the functional recovery of photoreceptors, the amplitude of the second stimulus compared to the first one is smaller, and that's what we measure. Results show that fame knockout retinas need more time to recover the light sensitivity in contrast to wild-type retinas. This result pointed to a possible specific function of fame in retinal phototransduction, in addition to a general cellular malfunction that could be consequence of ubiquitin accumulation or inflammation that we have previously observed. So therefore, we next were interested in the phototransduction signaling pathway at the molecular level. To make the long story short, I'm going to focus only in three main actors in the scene, that are rhodopsin, transducin, and arrestin. In the dark, rhodopsin remains inactive. After a light stimulus, rhodopsin is activated and transducin binds rhodopsin, being released the transducin alpha subunit, which activates phosphodiesterase and closes the channel at the plasma membrane. And this causes the photoreceptor's hyperpolarization. After this, a deactivation of the signal needs to be performed to open again the channel and allow the processing of a new light stimulus. In the deactivation process, rhodopsin is phosphorylated, and then arrestin binds phosphorhodopsin, allowing rhodopsin deactivation and the return to the basal conditions. Preliminary results analyzing the basal expression of two of, the, of these molecules show that both arrestin and transducin are decreased in fame knockout retinas, which could be related to a delayed activation of photoreceptors and thus to a worse recovery of a light sensitivity which was observed before in the functional analysis. We are now working in this line to elucidate the role of fame long in this signaling pathway. As I commented before, the main limitation of these results is that the knockout mouse model that we have used presents a lack of both fame short and fame lock isoforms. In order to overpass this limitation, and with the collaboration of Charles River, we have generated by CRISPR technology a novel knockout mouse model with the specific deletion of the fame long isoform. With this strategy, we have specifically deleted exon 2b, which is the specific one for fame long, while fame short expression in theory remains unaltered. We have obtained so far different lines that we, are recent, we recently started breeding, and but it has been a few months since we got the, the animal model, so we still haven't had time to perform any analysis with it but we trust it will help us elucidating the specific relevance of fame long in uh, the neuronal physiopathology, both in tauopathies and, and in retinal neurodegeneration. So as a summary and future steps, first we have found that fame long is decreased in Alzheimer's disease with special relevance in the tau pathology and that fame long co-immunoprecipitates with, with tau. Therefore, our aim now is to study the relationship between, between fame long and tau and to evaluate the possible role of fame long in tauopathies. Second, we have described that fame knockout mice show a neurodegenerative pattern in the retina with accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins, glial activation, and moderate photoreceptor cell death, as well as functional alterations in the photoreceptors, bipolar and ganglion cells activity. So our, our next step in this part is to elucidate, elucidate the role of fame long in the phototransduction signaling pathway. And in addition, of course, we are going to focus in the characterization of the new specific fame long knockout mouse model, specifically uh, focusing in neuronal and retinal degeneration. And just to finish, let me thank all the members of the group. And I would also like to highlight that the first studies that I presented uh, are the result of the work of several past members from the lab. 
and the projects ongoing that I showed are being con conducted by Raquel Vadillos in charge of the Tawapoti project and by Ana Martinez Cires in charge of the project on retinal physiopathology. And I would like also to thank our collaborators and funders and of course all of you for listening to this talk. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Monse. So the paper is now open for discussion. So let me remind you that um, if you want to make a question to Monse, uh, please use so, uh, do so by using the chat option in your um, screen, uh, just by stating your name and your interest in making uh, a question. There is no need to um, write down the questions. Uh, since I just um, give the floor to anyone interested, just um, put your name and your affiliation and, uh, and that's it. <clears throat> so in the, um, while we wait for, um, for the first uh, questions to arise, let me um, remind everyone um, that this um, webinar has been and is being recorded and it will be made available to everyone on the YouTube channel. Um, from Cybernet, so you can um, check if you um, if you arrive um, later. You can check the the whole webinar in there. Um, also, um, if you're interested in future webinars, um, our um, um, program for the next few months um, is already available at the Cybernet webpage, and um, so you can go there and check um, the upcoming webinars from now until July, I believe. So I have a, a hand raised, being raised here by um, Ignacio Torres Alemán. So um, uh, Ignacio, if you want to make a question, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I came a little bit late, so maybe I missed it, but you don't see any other alteration, gross alteration in the brain of this mutant? No, that's, that's correct. Uh, we have uh, looked for the different layers organization, excessive cell death, uh, neurogenesis, dendritic arborization, and uh, the main synaptic proteins, among other things, and nothing was was uh, significant. Well, it's quite intriguing. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ignacio and Monse. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> Okay, let me uh, make a quick question, Monse, if, uh, if I may. Um, I was also interested on in the um, interaction that you show on the um, uh, fame with uh, tau. Mm -hmm. um, have you used um, whole cell lysates to do that um, uh, immunoprecipitation experiments, or have you used tissue lysates? Or what we do is uh, to overexpress both proteins and then do the immunoprecipitation. We have tried several times with uh, lysates, and so far the protocol that we are using seems to not be working very well for tissues. So we are we keep trying. Okay. Have you checked whether that tau bound to fame is um, somehow phosphorylated or phosphorylation or modified? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. But this is something that we are working in to know whether the phosphorylation affects the binding or even to compare, we are trying to compare with a mutant tau uh, that in theory, theoretically is more phosphorylated to see if we have a uh, different interaction. And also with FEM short, because although we have checked that uh, at the basal uh, situation, it seems to be less interaction with FEM short than with FEM long. It's mm -hmm. something that we also need to check with uh, the modifications of tau. All right, thank you. All right, any other question? Um, I don't see any uh, one raising hands or sending any message through the chat, but uh, we can wait for one or two minutes just in case if someone else is interested in making a question.
Okay. Um, apparently, there are no more questions. So this is your last chance to make a question before we close the session then. Um, anyone? Well, I, I must say that we are not experts in tau pathology or in retina. So it's something that we have just uh, find on the way. So if it, it's anyone uh, and if there is anyone here that is an expert on these uh, two issues and wants to make us suggestions or whatever or collaborations, we are open, of course, so feel free to contact us. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I don't receive any other questions, so I think it's, um, it's then time to close the session. Not before uh, thanking Monse once again for um, her willingness to share her work with us. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. And just let me remind you that we'll have um, the next webinar in two weeks time, always on Thursdays at 3.30 p.m. So thank you Monse. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.